الله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على شرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فهو المهتد ومن يدلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله ذو لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أيتها الأخوات أيها الأخوة أحييكم بتحية الإسلام تحية من عند الله مباركة طيبة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Once again, I'm happy to be here with you, and it's an honor for me just to speak after our Imam Zaid Shakir and to listen to his words and his vision for us and the perception and the, the understanding of our mission and, and the priorities. And this is where I want to start in 40 minutes just to think about our understanding. And in the short clip, there was something which was for me quite interesting uh, when it comes to speaking about Western issues. Really, what I have been trying to do over the last 25 years is to think about both, in fact, Muslims in majority countries and Muslims in the West and to get a sense that we have common challenges. And also we have to come back to the better understanding of our religion in order to face the common challenges and to be also able to deal with some of the issues that we have in our society. Having said that now, I heard just Imam Zaid Shakir saying that we have to give precedence to salvation of our liberation. And as I understood what he was saying, my main concern is not to choose between the two, but to decide that one is the end of the other. The end of my liberation should be salvation, but I should liberate. I am here for liberation, liberating my ego, liberating this world of war, and liberating ourselves from oppression and colonization and alienation. The end should be clear, it's about salvation. And this is why we have to be very cautious. As Muslims, sometimes we confuse the means with the ends, and we take the means for the ends. Liberation is a means towards an end, and the end is salvation because we want to be close to God that not going to choose salvation by forgetting liberation. Because liberation is the necessity in our daily life. So let me come to our understanding of this discussion about secularism and secularization, and to come to the second part of what Imam Zaid Shakir was saying, and it's also uh, religions in the public sphere, and in which way we have to deal with it. Uh, what is said, and this is something which is a common discussion in Europe, and very often we speak about what is happening in France or what is happening in, the, the, in Europe as opposed to what is happening in Canada or it's happening in the United States of America when it comes to secularism and the process of secularization, but what we call to those secularity is distinguishing church from state and religion from state. So it's to be clear that there will be no imposition coming from the state into anything which has to do with religion. In fact, what is behind the whole process, and we have to understand this because the Muslims, they don't get this, which is quite important, was this separation between deen and the state, which is religion and the state, what is in fact at stake is the distinction between authorities, the authority of religion and the authority of the state, saying quite clearly that religions cannot impose anything onto the state, but the state cannot impose anything onto religion is a complementary approach. And this is something which came from the Western history while the process of secularization is coming from the West, if you come back to something which has to do with the very traditional Islamic understanding of authorities, we know this distinction between authorities in Islam. 
It's not the same model, but the principle of distinguishing the way we are with God and the way we are with human beings is clear. We are distinguishing authorities in the way we deal with the authority. It's not for us a divorce is a distinction. In the West, it became a divorce because of what happened with the imposition of the Catholic Church. So we have to understand the very essence of this relationship in the West and to understand that the very essence of this secularization process and secularity, distinguishing the authorities, has to do with distinguishing uh, the two powers. And it's important not to forget to speak about power when we speak about that, and you will come to it. The second point which is important was in the West, when we speak about the secular system, this is where and through this process that it was possible to deal with pluralism in these societies. In the West, pluralism as to religions came from this process because the people who were supporting this process of the secularization were the Protestant and the Jews because they were understanding that this would be the way for them to protect their very existence and the people who had, who had no religion as well. So for us, once again, it's important to understand what we are talking about and what is behind it is pluralism within the Western society. It's understood as coming along the process of secularization. And with this, there is something which is to distinguish between the common ground, which would be our citizenship within the society, and this diversity of cultures and religions that should be integrated, respected, but had no authority on the state. So the state should be the uh, guardian of all this space, the neutral space, the public sphere, where no one can impose onto the other. So this is the way it came to a reality that uh, the secular uh, system is protecting pluralism and pluralism of religions. This is all in theory. This is the way it was understood and experienced in many uh, societies, speaking about common and equal citizenship, freedom of conscience and freedom of worship as the two main principles, and tolerance as a reference. And the philosophers like Hobbes and Locke were talking about this is the only way for us to get religions, tolerance, and authority in our society and in the West. So we have to get this and to understand that. Now, the American history, North American history in, in the United States of America or in Canada, it's not exactly the same that this, the history in Europe. And even in Europe, the British history is not the same as the French history. Every society is, went through the same secularization process, but not through the same and with the same model. So we have to study every single model. If you want to talk about this, you need to get the collective psychology of a specific nation to get a better understanding of how you are dealing with it and how you are using the concept. Now, it's important when I just heard uh, Imam Zaid Chakir saying, if you come back to the States or to the North American societies, just to go for laicism is against the Constitution. This is not us. This is France or this is some European models. And I think it's at, at the same time right and maybe a misconception of the way it's played in Europe. And this is why it's important to study the very essence of the national discussions in, the, in Europe and in the West. Why? Because we are misled by ideologues using the system with something else. They have an agenda. And if we don't know history, if we don't study, we don't study what is happening, we are following the footsteps of, where, of, of them where they want us to go and they want us to fall into the trap of this discussion. So let me come to some of the points that we have to raise and then to come to our role in the public sphere today, adding or just 
coming from an, a different angle as uh, what was said by our Imam uh, Zaid Shakir just before. The first problem is that, as I said, millions of Muslims today living in the West, in Canada, in the United States of America, and in every single European country don't have a problem with the secular system if the secular system is implemented the way it should be. We don't have a problem with the law. We abide by the law of the country. We are showing this every day, day in, day out. The, um, the, the, the Western Muslims are abiding by the law. More importantly even, we know that if we were in Europe or in the United States of America under the authority of the Catholic Church the way it was in the Middle Ages, it would be more difficult for a Muslim to live as a Muslim in this society. We understand that the system is protecting us within this society. It's a way of protecting pluralism. We know that this is a reality of history, that it helped the religious minorities to be protected. So we need to get this. We need to get this understanding that this process helped this religious pluralism that we are experiencing. Now, it's not enough. And it's not enough to get to this. Why? Because we have three problems. The first problem is, while the process was to differentiate between authorities and to help the religions to have a place in society without imposing anything unto the citizens, we have new ideologues of laicity or secularization or secularity or secularism in their mind. The system is against religion. They are transforming it into something which is not regulating the religious presence but removing religions from being visible in our society. It's an atheist ideology and it's struggling and resisting and fighting against anything which is religious. So today the problem that we have, for example, in France, when you listen to people, this is not the French system. It's the French system read by ideologues of this kind of laicism, which is against religion. So, this is to be understood why. Because you know, for years, 30 years, we started to learn the law of the country, to understand that we don't have a problem with the law, but the law is not enough. The point is, who is reading the law? Who has the power to interpret the law? It's a question of power. Because at the end of the day, if you read the law, and you trust the citizen, you integrate the citizen. But if you read the law by targeting the citizen, you use the law against the citizen and against the people who are perceived as a threat. What we are saying to the French government, for example, and many European government, and even now it's coming here in your country. In Canada, you have a discussion not only in Quebec, but in Canada, you have now trends of people using secularization, saying Islam per se is against it. They are not going to integrate. But it's not the first time we heard that. We heard that for the Jews before. We heard that for the people before us, that they are not going to integrate into the system. Meaning here that we have new ideologies of secularism, but we have also power and people reading the law in a specific way. So this is why if you refer to the law, you know it's got going to, to, not going to be enough. Look what happened in your country, in, in, in the United States of America. What happened just after September 11, when the people were saying, have you seen the respect of the law? In less than one year, the law were interpreted in a way which was accepting treatment that are unequal, that are targeting people, and targeting people in a way which was discriminatory. 
So the law could be changed in one way or another if you feel that you are under siege. And this is exactly what is happening. What we are asking, for example, in Europe, we are saying implement the law the way it is. What we are asking you is not to have a specific treatment. We want you to, interpret, to implement the law equally for all the citizens. It's not what is happening now. It's not what is happening now. And this has to do with who is interpreting the law. Are we able to come with a better understanding of this law? So the point for us, when it comes to all this discussion, don't forget when you speak about the legal system to speak about the authority and power, who is behind these interpretations and what is, what is done and who is targeted. The last thing which is important for us when it comes to a question of power is we are perceived today as a new active minority, as Muslim. And we are not perceived first as citizens, but it's a religious minority and it's shaking the, the, our, this history. Why? Because many people very recently had a discussion with uh, Christopher Hitchens and he was saying, you know, this coming back of religion and the Muslims are perceived as the people coming back with God. So you come back with God, we had finished this story and you come back with him. You come back with him and you come back, you speak about religion. And this is where the perception is, it's a question of power. And be careful. It's not because the law is saying you are going to be treated equally that you are going to be treated equally. By law in this country and by law in the country in the United States of America or by law in Europe, when you are by origin a black African, a North African Arab, a Pakistani, a Turkish man or a Turkish woman, you should be treated equally by law. It's not happening because it's a question of power. Who is implementing this law and targeting specific people? In this country, this is also becoming a reality. In the United States of America, you don't get the, really, the, the very essence of, you know, you can refer to the Constitution and the, 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 the history of this American dream. It's an American dream, but as for equal citizenship in the United States of America is written in articles of law, it's not the real experience of people. It's not. And we have to understand this, that as Muslims, if you refer to the law, it's the starting point of the discussion, but you have to be involved in something which has to do with how do you deal with your presence in this society. Ideology, implementation, and power struggle, this is also something which is part of the whole process in the secular, or, or the process of secularization. And for us, it's important to study all this. Last year, in uh, Rome, the personal advisor to the Pope, uh, Cardinal Tron, was saying, we need to thank the Muslims because they bring back religion and God in Europe that they are helping us to speak about God without being scared or afraid of referring to him. And this is something which is, and this is something which is important because this is the perception many have in the West that by coming back with our religion or being present and visible in our, with our religion, we are bringing back religion in the public sphere and within our society. Now, that's all good to say, look, first, as a principle, we don't have a problem with a secular society distinguishing authority and, and letting us find our way within the system. We don't have a problem with this. As Muslims, we should manage, we should find our way, and we should be able to get this as something which is part of our destiny in this society. We don't have a problem with this. This is one. Second, what we want is real equality between citizens. 
we should be able as Muslims and as Christians and as Jews and as atheists and agnostics to find our way in this society, we don't have a problem. Having said this, now, the perception is everywhere that the more we go, the more we understand, yes, you brought back God in, in the public sphere, but now we have voices everywhere. And I thought for a while that it's going to be in Europe. And it came to the United States of America. It's already in Canada. All this business about stop Islamization of America, stop Islamization of Europe, stop Islamization, which means you brought back God, but you are colonizing us. And colonizing us means we are the victims of this new visibility of the Muslims. And what is expected now is to have Muslim free zones, no symbols, no presence. We don't want to see your mask. We don't want to, to see your headscarves. You don't want to see you. No color, no dress, no minarets, no architecture. The good Muslims are the invisible Muslims. And you know what is sad? is that some Muslims are ready for that. They are not only ready in the way they dress, they are ready in the way they speak. They are ready in the way they deal with problems in this society. And this is very worrying. These Muslims that think that to be accepted in this society, you have to disappear. So now we have to ask ourselves, the, some of these ideologues, are putting us in a corner and pushing us to be obsessed with the visibility of the symbols. We don't have a problem with the visibility and we need to be assertive. This is a right, this is right according to any secular system. We don't have to disappear. No, 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 please. Remember the personal fatwa? which is once again, don't take it wrong, it's not a fatwa against clapping for the... No, it's just that I don't, don't like it. I don't like this emotional reaction. It's not good for you because you cannot concentrate. It's not good for my ego because sometimes you feel that it's good to be... Okay, you follow that? That's it. So, the point here is really for us to be able to say, look, we are pushed into a corner where because the people are saying, we don't want to see you, we don't want to see you, we come with this and we are aggressive on this. We have to be clever. We should not have any problem with being visible. But now we have to decide the substance of our visibility. Is it only in the headscarf? Is it only in the dress? Is it only in the architecture? Or should we add something else? What is the added value of Muslims in the public sphere in the West? This is the question. So to have visible mosque, no problem. To wear the headscarf, no problem. And if someone is telling you, you know what, because they don't like it, just remove it. This is the way you are going to be accepted. So just go and ask the black brothers and sisters to change the color. This is not going to happen be assertive and respected in the way you dress, in the way you are, and don't let anyone change your religion because of fear. This is right according to the law. E no, even in France, even in France, you know what we were, we were told for years, you want to change the law. And we said, we don't want to change the law. By law, by the French law, it's possible to go to school with the headscarf. They ended up in 2004 to change the law themselves to make it un, un, uh, unlawful. They changed the law. We didn't because by law it was right. If it was wrong, why to change the law then? Why did you change the law if it was wrong before the law was enforced? It's just showing that when you have the power, you have even the power to change the law in a way which is restrictive, which is discriminatory, which is just the right way to think that you are liberating the women. So I think that the, the visibility that we want today, for us, we have to think about it. 
what are we talking about? What do we want exactly? Which kind of visibility? And this is where, as Imam Zedchakir was saying, and we keep on repeating this year after year, it's this visibility not of the symbols only, but the visibility of the contribution. The visibility of our contribution, this is it. And it has to be multifaceted, intellectual, psychological, spiritual, religious, and in all the fields where we have and when we should be a contribution to the society. And this is why we want to come back to the public sphere, not saying that religions should be invisible, but what should be visible in religion? Is it only to say I'm a Muslim and it should be visible? Or should we come with something which is the meanings of things? You know, after all this, I'm now concentrating in two books. The last book that I just published is The Quest for Meaning. Reminding the Muslims put the meanings before the rules in order to get the right way of understanding the rules. The rules are coming after the meanings. And if you understand the divine pedagogy when he was revealing the Quran, it's all about the meaning first. All the, the, the last verses of the Quran, the last chapters of the Quran, the Surat al-Quran, at the end, are all coming for the, with the meaning first. Wal-Fajr, Ashr. All this is, look at the world, this has a meaning. It means that the meaning of this world, he is here. There is one God, la ilaha illallah. And then you pray, because you know that he is here. So the meaning before the rules, it's a quest for meaning. But if you come to the people, they have lost this sense of God, of sense of meaning and say, you know what, this is it. If you put the rules before even talking about the meaning of things, the ethics, the objectives, they're going to be loud, they're not going to listen. What are you talking about? You speak about liberating yourself with a meaning, they look at you as being in jail with the rules. If you don't get the meaning of the rules, you are perceived as in jail. If you get the spiritual meaning of the rules, you re liberate yourself from the ego and from anything which is wrong. So you have to come with this. So this is something which is the quest for meaning. And then we have something which is important in our quest for meaning as Muslims, is then when you are with your fellow citizens and when you are with Muslims, when you think about this quest for meaning, you have to take it from wherever it is. You can take from the people and you have to study what they have to say. You live in a society where we are serious about pluralism. What is your attitude as Western Muslims towards pluralism? It's just to show that you are Muslim or are you studying? Are you studying what they have to say? For example, I asked the brother to put, I'm teaching philosophy in Morocco and Islamic studies in Qatar and in Oxford. I want this to be clear for you. Because very often I have people coming and say, you know what, Tariq Ramadan is a philosopher. Meaning it's far from the rules and from the Islamic teaching because the Islamic teaching, this is the rules, this is Islamic study. What is this? What is this understanding that philosophy should not be studied? Philosophy is very important in our understanding. It's the question of why. And you have to get these questions coming from other philosophies. You know your religion and you deal with philosophies and spiritualities in an open mind, with an open mind. And you take from this. So developing a philosophy of pluralism, which is the subtitle of the book, was to open up towards all these questions that are so important. And you know what happened? The first journalist who came to me talking about the book the first question he asked me is, after reading the book, say, wow, that's a very, very, it's a book with a very open mind and a very open heart. And he looked at me and he said, are you still a believer? As if the Muslims, the way they are perceived is you speak about Islam, you th think about Islam, but you are not interested into the other traditions. You are not interested by the other traditions. That's wrong. This is where we have to come with this understanding. If you want to be serious about bringing back 
the very essence of religions and this quest for this liberation towards salvation, you have to come with this quest for meaning, to be able to be knowledgeable about your own religion and to learn from the other religions, to learn from the other spiritualities. So when you are here, you know, thousands are coming. You come to listen to Islamic talks and we speak about our religion. You also have to come back home, take books, and read about the other traditions, the other, the way the people, because you have to come with this within the society. This is where you are an added value to this society. When you are able to help the Christians to know better their religion, to come with the Buddhist tradition and to understand what is very good for us also to listen to. Because it's very interesting for the Muslims fasting Ramadan to listen to the Buddhist tradition telling you, liberate yourself from your ego. This is the way towards liberation. Because we today are coming back to Ramadan. The way we fast is sometimes not the way it should be. We eat more during Ramadan than during the other months of the, the year. So it's not the essence. So when you, you deal with others, they send you back to the very essence of your religion. So my point here, when we think about this, the presence of religions in the public sphere and in which way we have to deal with this, as I said, we don't have a problem with the law. We don't have a problem with the way it should be in theory. Now we know that it's going to be difficult in practice because what is happening is really a discriminatory process and we are perceived as a danger. How do we change this? Not by being visible only with our symbols, but visible with our contribution, the added value of the Muslim presence in the West. And by the way, not only in the West, it should be the same in all the society, what we are bringing to the society. So this is where the visibility of our contribution is, for example, and Imam Zaid Shakir was speaking about it when he was speaking about individuals. Please, in your daily life, with people who are living with you, never hesitate to say that you pray. Say it. Say that you pray. I'm praying. I believe in God. And it has a meaning, not only to come here and to pray five times a day and to be, no, say it outside. The people around you should know. The people around you should know that you stick to a personal discipline. Yes, I pray. And I fast. And you should get the very essence of why I fast. I fast because it's good for myself. It's purifying my body. It's helping me to be close to God. It's helping me to be close to the poor people. This is why I fast. Tell the people, you know this quest for meaning, when you sit with people and they look at you, think about what they are looking for. They are looking for meaning. They are looking, you know, why are you doing this? Not only to be to just, oh, it's difficult, I'm, I'm, I'm fasting. They don't care about the difficulty. They care about the ends. Why are you doing this? Dare to say it, that you are fasting. Dare to say that you are paying the zakat. And this is the visibility of your presence. This is your contribution. That you still believe in things that are so important for you. The people don't pray. You have to, to speak about praying. But to speak about praying, the, our presence in the public sphere is something which has to be done with dignity. Recently, the leader of the Front National in France was saying, look at these Muslims colonizing our streets as the Nazi were colonizing us during the Second World War. And it became a controversial thing. And all the people were saying, look what it was, at what, she, what she's saying, and just criticizing that. But she's sending a message that the way sometimes we are in the society, we have to ask for masks. We have to build masks, yes, but we have to do it with dignity. Sometimes, I'm sorry to say that the Muslims are not disciplined. The way we deal with our neighbor is wrong. So it's as if we don't care. I'm praying, I'm doing something right. So whatever you think, I don't care. It's not like that. Respect the people, but be able to speak about the very essence of what is praying for you. What is fasting for you? Why do you wear the headscarf? Speak about the essence of things. Don't be trapped in the symbols. 
So this is, these are things that are very important in our way of talking. The presence of religion in the public sphere is a discourse, is a way you talk, is a way you explain, is a way the people can see, I live as you live. I'm in the same society, but what I'm protecting is the meaning of my life. My life has a meaning with dignity. And this is why in the job, in, in, when you are in your uh, job dealing with your uh, fellow, uh, you know, uh, civil servants, teachers, whatever you are doing, they need, it's very important for them to see this science of something which is an ethics. Faith should be visible through this. But don't be scared when it comes to speaking about praying, fasting, and being able also to speak about the meaning and also to speak about what you are trying to do. At the end of the day, what we are trying to do is to be close to Allah SWT. We are trying to get this inner peace. Speak about it and try to experience it. Speak more about it among Muslims. Speak about it among Muslims. Don't speak only about halal and haram. Bring this into our community which is the very essence of our religion, the meaning of things. This remembrance is something which is essential. We are people of dhikr. We are people of remembrance. Don't forget, forgetfulness is the end of the dignity of human being. Our dignity is in our, the way we remember the meaning and the closeness to God. This is the oneness of God. This is a tawheed. So we need to talk about this more. This is this presence, not only through the rules, through the symbols, but through the meaning and the understanding. Now, Zaid Chakir was saying something very important in our way of dealing with being citizens. You know, I don't, it's not enough for me to speak again and again about being a citizen. Of course we have to be a citizen. You are American or Canadian citizens. You live in this country as American or Canadian citizens, that's fine. What is your added value? The added value is an ethics of citizenship. It's to normalize the Muslim presence without trivializing it. What are you giving to this society? So ethics of citizenship is really to be quite clear about, yes, we have rights, but we need to contribute, we have duties towards the community. In politics, it's important to be involved in politics in our society as Muslims. So all the people who are telling you, you know, as Muslims disappear from any political discourse is wrong. So when I heard someone in Singapore saying, you know, we have to completely separate politics from religion, it's never happened, even what you were saying. I heard in Britain, the prime minister speaking about going in Iraq after having prayed God that this was the right and you got the same thing in the United States of America. The point is not to, to divorce. The point is to be able to say we want more ethics in politics. We want more religious ethics in politics could be or rational ethics. Whatever, but ethics is essential. It's the way you deal with power. It's the way we deal with good governance. It's the way we deal with principles. So we need to be involved in this. So to be involved in politics, in political parties, in the society, as citizens, as elected or electing, that's good. As long as the added value is applied ethics. It's ethics in your daily life that you have morality, that you have values, that you stand for something. So this is where we come, it's, once again, it's meaning. It's not, I'm doing this as a Muslim. Of course the people can see that behind what you are doing, there is something which is a driving force. But don't put Islam as a jail for the people to not understand what you want. Just put the principles as an open principle for all. And you, will, you are going to be understood if you are able to come with this kind of involvement in your society. And it means as well that it's not only as citizens that you have to speak about the Canadian citizens. Be careful. There is something which is called modern slavery. There is something which is a danger for all the West. It's just to talk about us as citizens and now we are criminalizing the immigrants. 
You can't accept that. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَ بَنِي آدَمْ means every single human being should be treated with dignity. Now we have our people, so we treat good the Canadian, we treat good the American, we treat good the British, the French, but the people who are coming criminalize them. Are you accepting this? And you know what? You see Muslims, Canadian Muslims, European Muslims, American Muslims, they are happy with this. They don't want to talk about it. If you are serious about this, if you come with ethics in politics, is to challenge the governments by saying you can't treat human beings the way you are treating them. This new slavery, to just to, to protect the boundaries and to let the people come underground and to exploit them, this is not acceptable as Muslims. This is not acceptable as human beings. Where are the Muslim voices speaking about this? We are not talking about that. We just want to be integrated and accepted as citizens. I don't care. It's over. I'm even talking about the post-integration discourse, which has to do with contribution. Now we have to show the way to the Western societies. You are not going to survive by criminalizing the immigrants and to treat them as second-class human beings. That's not possible. And by the way, as much I'm saying this here, I have to say it in petrol monarchies and in the Muslim majority countries where immigrants are treated as slaves as well. It's an international disease. It's an international danger. It's something that we cannot accept. So this is where we need to talk about this. And please, if you are talking about peace, you need to talk about justice. Please don't be the new Canadian citizens and the American citizens and the European citizens. They are going to talk about ethics at the local level and forgetting the international issues. Now, while I'm talking to you still in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Africa, in Palestine, you are people treated in a way which is not acceptable. And we are involved. Our governments are involved. No, 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 no. The point for me is this. Ethics in politics is to be able to speak and to dare to speak. Anyone in the name of this be peaceful is telling you to stop talking about the realities of oppression in this world is not helping. You are not an added value to Canada if you stop talking to the Canadian government by saying supporting the war in Iraq is wrong. Being silent in what is happening in, in Palestine is wrong. To keep silent to what is happening in Africa is wrong. You should be the voice for the voiceless. This is ethics in politics. This is the way you challenge power. This is the way you come with, this is the way I deal with religion. I don't want to impose anything to anybody. I'm not here to convert. Because this is coming from God. It's not of my business to convert the people. I'm just here. I'm just here to be the voice for the voiceless. So this is something which is important. Now, just to go to the end, and it was said, so I don't want to repeat, but this is the way I, I want us to deal with politics. Is ethics in politics means all this at the local level, at the national level, at the national level when it comes to immigration, at the international level when it, when it comes to oppression, and to be able to speak about this. It's also to be able to speak about education and the educational system in this society. Because this is something which is important. I'm sorry to see that the Muslims, very often, they think that the only answer to a broken educational system is to think that you are going to solve the problem with Islamic schools. Islamic schools, that's fine, but it's a minority of Muslims who are going to be there. The great majority of the Muslims are in the mainstream school system. What is your input? What are you coming with? What are you contributing with? when it comes to the substance of what is taught, when it's coming to the teachers, when it's coming to the school itself, the second class schools that we have in some inner cities, the teachers that are not trained. This is injustice. So if you have a moral voice, if you speak about ethics, you still you have to deal with this. This is where we have to be in education. So it's part of our uh, contribution to be able to speak about this. You know, 
Once I was with Chandra Muzaffar, Dr. Chandra Muzaffar from Malaysia. And he was saying, we don't have a problem with the secular system, but there is uh, the paradigm which is behind it. It's, it's problematic. And he was saying, you still have, as Muslims, in the public sphere, to come with a discourse stressing the importance of family, stressing the importance of the first social setting, which is family. So for us, it's important the way we deal with the elderly in our society, the way we deal with the parents, the way we deal with the kids. Family is critical. This is also the public sphere. And as Muslims, we have to be involved in this discussion. The meanings here are important. What is a family? What are the objectives of a family? And this is why we also have to, to speak and to be able to speak about love. You know, you can't come today and to say, if, you know, a, a marriage is between a man and a woman, it's rules and halal and haram. We need to come with educating the people to love in a better way. And as Muslims, are we able to talk about this? Are we to, able to talk and to come as Muslims with the very understanding of what it means? This relationship between mawaddatan wa rahmah that is part of what is a couple, what it means to be two, and what it means then to be three and four and to build a family. Are we coming with this? Are we able as Muslims not to protect ourselves from the surrounding environment, but to protect, but to spread around a better understanding of what family is? If religion has a meaning today, is to be able to speak about this in a way which is also self-critical, because we are the first as Muslims to say that Islam is promoting family as a central value. But look at the way we are dealing with our own families. The lack of communication, crisis. You know what is happening in the West? The Muslim families are colonized the same way. And if someone wants to be serious about integration, look at the figures and we should, you, you should see we are very much integrated into the reality of the West. And this is critical. This is worrying. So let me come to my uh, conclusion. I know I'm just one minute that I just want to add two things very quickly as a conclusion. You know, we, sp we spoke about ethics, citizenship, politics. We spoke about social justice, the way we have to deal with our contribution. Be serious as Muslims about the fact that you don't differentiate between a black and a white. Be serious as Muslims that you will struggle for the rights of the poor people and the black people in this society. Be serious about that. Be serious about that. Don't come to this convention here with all these people and you know that there is a missing dimension of this community here. The poor are not here. The poorest people of our community are not in this room tonight. And if you want to be the voice for the voiceless, you have to care about them. They are facing in inner cities a treatment which is not right. Care about them and show that you care about them in your daily struggle. Showing solidarity and showing that it's a struggle for justice. And then the last point is also for us. The universal language today in the public sphere is music, movies, arts. Are we going to be able to do something about this? Are we going to be able to propose something which is an alternative, ethics in arts? Are we going to be creative? Because it has to do with this. There is no civil society without imagination and symbols, representation and self-representation. As Muslims, we have to be involved in that. We have to have some bright brothers and sisters, citizens, Canadian citizens, coming with this. Which kind of arts? Do we have to build mosques that are only oriental? That's good, we have mosques. Keep them, it's beautiful. But come with new creativity, new mosques that are fitting in this setting, in this society. We need Canadian taste. We need American taste. We need a Western taste that is able for us to be present with this. Don't be trapped in this visibility of the symbols. While the symbols are good, but we, are, we should add that we are here 
in our societies, and this is the way we are also dealing with the meta-language, which is the symbols, which are the symbols that we have and which is the reality of our uh, understanding. So, having said this, there is something which is not perceived by us in the civil society. When we are here, I, 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 I heard you laugh when Zaychaker was talking. You know what is missing? There is nothing wrong as Muslims to have a sense of humor. It's nothing wrong to be involved in our society with a sense of humor. It's nothing wrong to understand that this communication is important. It's part of the civil society. And it's also a religious presence to be able to say I have an ethics, I have moral, morality, I have principles, but I'm able to deal with this society with humor, understanding, communication, be Canadian Muslims with all these dimensions. And this is the way, as Muslims, we are bringing meanings in our society and not only rules, sharing and not only imposition. This is the universal message that we have to promote, and this is, inshallah, something which is part of our understanding. We don't have a problem with this, but we need to struggle and we need to promote and we need to share, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.